Hey listeners, welcome to another episode of Brown Girl Street podcast. This is your host Aman Tiwana and this is Kathy Thakur and both of us love reading books. On this podcast we bring our favorite books to you and discuss the parts that were most meaningful to us and how we found them interesting or relatable as brown girls. Today we are discussing a collection of personal essays by Nora Ephron. I feel bad about my neck. Nora Ephron was an American writer and filmmaker. famously known for her romantic comedies like Sleepless in Seattle and When Harry Met Sally and you can see the magic of her writing in this book too but before we begin our discussion let's hear the overview of the book from Kathy in i feel bad about my neck nora efron shares with us her ups and downs a candid hilarious look at women who are getting older and dealing with the tribulations of maintenance menopause empty nests and life itself Efron chronicles her life as an obsessed cook, passionate city dweller, and hapless parent. But mostly, she speaks frankly and uproariously about life as a woman of a certain age. We have selected our favorite essays from this book. But before we get into further detail, let's hear a quick word from our sponsor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. It's free. There is creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. The first essay in the book is about aging. and since we are not that old i mean we are old but like still young i was like why is she so concerned about her neck in old age but then i realized that we might not relate to specifically her rant about the neck but i think i can notice little subtle changes in my body you know between when i was 22 and now metabolism goes down you can't digest heavy food you can't drink more than two glasses of wine or one glass of cocktail On top of all that your skin just stops shining. Like I think I'll have to spend 4 hours doing things to my face to have the same flawless look I had when I was 22. And now I think I should also stop before I write my own version of this book. Oh my god, this is so sad. <laughs> I'm just going to move on from this. Okay, so yeah, let's just stay in denial. <laughs> We don't want to take the red pill. Yeah, happy things only. <laughs> And speaking of happy things, let's talk about handbags. Yes, yeah, let's talk about handbags. <laughs> so she has a whole chapter that's dedicated to purses, and I think I kind of related to what she was saying. I think handbags are really pretty, but when it comes to carrying one myself, I find that it's a lot of effort, honestly. Yeah, even a small bag actually feels like baggage to me. That's why I think I like to wear jeans because I can just put my phone in my pockets and I don't need to carry any bag. Or if I can find a dress which has pockets in it, that would be the best thing ever, I think. Yeah, I know there are not enough dresses with pockets. Yeah, what's that about? She also mentions that there is this obligation you have that your bag should kind of match what you're wearing, and I feel like that's a very slippery slope because sooner than you would realize, your closet will be filled with bags, and there will be no space left for your clothes. I know, <laughs> and I can't even justify the cost of bags to myself. I like, know, yeah. I have a few bags, but my sister gave me those as a gift, and even those just sit in my closet for the most part. Personally, I've realized I'm more of a backpack person. Maybe like either I'll have no bag, or I'll have a bag so full that it's breaking my back. <laughs> Can I just say that of all the books I've ever read, this one chapter on purses. in this book is what i related to the most <laughs> it's almost as if she came into my life talked to me about aging and random stuff first and then suddenly told me you know what i know what's the root cause of all your problems in life it's your purse it has always been your purse <laughs> <laughs> it kind of makes sense yeah and her writing is just the right kind of sarcastic humor you know i really loved her writing like it's so witty I realized one reason why I have been much happier in the past few months is because I don't have to care about my purse anymore. Like you know about cleaning it, but it's like a reminder of everything that's wrong in myself when I look at that filthy mess inside of my purse. <laughs> How filthy are you, Kathy? 
you have to see inside my purse <laughs> you know this just reminds me of something a friend shared her mom was visiting and one day she comes home to find that her mom has washed all of her purses all of her louis vuitton tory burch michael kors and everything oh my she God. hand washed them and she came home to find them drying on a rack in her balcony <laughs> Oh no I feel so sad right now for her <laughs> it's hurting me <laughs> There's a chapter in the book which I think I related to the most and any girl or woman reading this book would too This is about maintenance And in the chapter she starts with talking about hair maintenance even before I read what she had to say I was like yeah I get it Nora I get what you're trying to say. <laughs> and in the chapter she says, "Aren't you sick of your hair? Aren't you tired of washing and drying it?" It was funny because I read this part right after I had just washed my hair. So, when I read this, I was like, "Yes, I am tired of this." <laughs> Interestingly, she also held up a statistical mirror for the readers that if you spend let's say 1 hour on your hair every day which i'm sure a lot of people do i myself did it until very recently you have actually spent 365 hours in a year on your hair alone that's like 9 work weeks yeah. you know we don't even get this much vacation time in a year i agree something had to be said about this maintenance is so costly both in terms of money and in terms of time yeah and her rant about the shampoo brands in this chapter i mean that's america there have been so many times when i go to walmart and i think to myself today i'm going to research on all the shampoos and conditioners and buy one that perfectly suits my hair but 2 minutes into that lane and i'm already exhausted and confused and tired and i'm like just just give me one brand that i can use that will make my hair better <laughs> Well, I understand actually. Like there are endless options out there, and each claims to be the best. And yeah. they're like, we will do wonders to your hair. Honestly, in the end, I don't think they make much a difference. Like if you compare a few, so I it's just confusing so. us. Yeah, and you know, there's like the shampoo is for dry hair, the shampoo is for oily hair. And at this point, I'm like, I don't know what my hair is. I just need one shampoo. <laughs> I know like sometimes I go on Sephora website and there's like a section of what problems you have like let's uh-huh. say you're buying a shampoo it's like dry hair frizzy hair oily scalp I don't know what else and I'm not sure what I'm selecting is actually right I'm just picking <laughs> a few things so I can yeah. just get done with this yeah and she also gives a solution which is not really economical she says that she goes to a hair parlor twice in a week because she finds it too annoying to care for her hair by herself and like going to a hair parlor twice in a week <laughs> that's like too much money and too much time wasted again right i can just think of like how much time you would need to like drive to the place find parking go there just the planning around these things is so dreadful that i would not do those and not to mention all the small talk you have to do i actually hate salons mainly for the small talk Like just stop talking to me. If I'm here to get my hair cut, I've told you what I want. Please cut my hair and send me on my way. <laughs> But I can't sit there and have conversations. And mainly because we have to talk so much in so many situations, like meetings and all that. Sunday is maybe the day when I don't want to talk to anyone, and then I can't get my hair done in peace. There's a thing in America which I don't think I understand still. It's this obsession with getting nails done like i've been here for what 8 or 9 years now and i don't get it honestly like women make a day of it it's like a thing people go together as girlfriends to get many pedis and i don't yeah. really get it it's not me even in college when you are a broke student you are cutting back on groceries i would see girls cut back on basic necessities like food but then still go and get many pedis wow. i i don't know how they justify or how their brains work however like media has planted this as a necessity in their minds i agree and i mean you know once you get your nails done it they look really pretty for like probably two days and then you know they just or start to if you wash dishes yeah exactly and somehow Also like all these many pedis feel so overpriced to me and like again like so much time wasted true 
but you know thanks to covid no one expects us to do anything anymore yeah <laughs> we are saving a lot of time speaking of time that's another factor which goes in when i think of all the time people spend at salons at the end of the day i feel like i wasted all my day going to a salon like doing something and then i feel like i could have just sat home and read a book finished a book in the yeah. same amount of time i went to get my hair done or my nails done or even just slept you know yeah exactly like if you catch up on your sleep you will not be so stressed wouldn't that actually make you look and feel better instead of just running all day like a headless chicken to get your hair done <laughs> and speaking of hair she also does touch on unwanted hair which is a big part of maintenance for any woman and yeah i don't think that's going away honestly of course but what i really found funny in this section was the way she talked about threading she had this like wonder in how she explained threading and it actually made me laugh because for us it's just something that has always been a part of life and you just knew even as kids that at a certain age you just start getting threading done she explained threading like some magical thing <laughs> oh and also while we're on the subject of threading it's just a random fun fact threading is a 6000 year old tradition that originated from india that's so cool oh wow i didn't know this 6000 years is a lot it kind of also explains that we have a 6000 year old tradition of fixating on looks actually that's the biggest tradition right fixating on looks <laughs> <laughs> everything else c- comes from it <laughs> so true well speaking of looks skin care is a big part of it as well which nora talks about and i think i suck at it like i spent so much money on all these products with like a new resolve every time that i will take better care of my skin and i will make a routine part of it is because we keep getting all these messages from like brands and companies that you should do that but recently i'm beginning to realize that it's just not me and yeah. i'm just this lazy person who's probably better suited to a minimalist skin care routine or by that i mean no skin care routine at all <laughs> Yeah, you know, skin care is that thing in my life that I want to do, but I don't know. Maybe the universe doesn't want me to do it. <laughs> yeah, how can we go against universe, right? Yeah. <laughs> And I find it really annoying how much it is marketed at us. Like recently even in the name of self-care, they have just started selling all these skin care products. In fact, they have even placed this guilt because if you don't practice skin care, you must be this person who cannot care for themselves. Oh yeah, self care is kind of like that thing now, right? That yeah, self care is like putting a pack on your skin and yeah, self care day like. means just bubble bath, face yeah. mask, and many pedis. That's it. Self care could also just mean sleeping. Yeah, <laughs> Or, sleeping, reading a book, not talking to people, whatever you need. That's self care. But no, put on a <laughs> face mask even if you're stressed, and that's self care. <laughs> and you know what kyati after i finished this chapter i finally understood why i suck at time management because when i'm planning for my week or my day nowhere i'm accounting for all these maintenance activities and they do end up taking a lot of our time end of the day or end of the week i'm stressed that i had planned to do all these things and i couldn't do them so my question is did the maintenance really help me that's that's an existential question <laughs> okay, you can go. Today's episode is brought to you by Fix. Of course, we at Brown Girls Read enjoy reading to relax and unwind. But as women, there are many other ways to indulge in relaxation. A great way to relax and indulge, self-pleasure. Whether for solo play, mutual enjoyment, or even just curiosity, Fix has a variety of pleasure products to meet all needs. From vibrators to wands, G-spot massagers, there are tons of items for you to explore. During this time in our world, taking time for ourselves is something we have to do for ourselves. We looked at their website and saw quite a few items that we would really like to try. What makes Fix products great? They find people of all walks of life and sexual health experts to do testing and reviews. If it's not a winner, they toss it. If their people love it, it's a definite go. Fix sources products that are sexy, sleek, but most importantly, safe for our bodies. Do yourself a favor and visit 
www.letsfix.com. Use promo code BROWN to receive a $5 off your first order. Again, it's www.letsphix.com. Capable Monsters is a new book of poetry by Marlin M. Jenkins that uses the Pokédex to explore blackness, queerness, and coming of age in America. With the narrative richness of the world of Pokémon as a backdrop, Capable Monsters charts what it means when we are made to feel like monsters and how we fit into our world. You can get Capable Monsters now from BullCityPress.com and listeners of this show can save $5 on any book order by entering the coupon code BROWNGIRLSREAD. You'll save on books like Equilibrium by Tiana Clark, The Wishbone Dress by Cassandra Bay Bruner and Season of Tears by Leah Silvius. That's $5 off on any book order at Bull citypress.com with coupon code brown girls read capable monsters by marlin m jenkins have you ever loved anything you were not afraid of she's also talking about this story in one of the essays in the book where she fell in love with one of the apartments on upper west side and paid 25000 as key money to rent that apartment and the monthly rent was around 2500 And then slowly, the rent laws in New York changed. Rent control got demolished. Her rent actually tripled from twenty five hundred dollars to seventy five hundred dollars. But she still kept living in that apartment with her family because you know she loved that apartment. Then the rent increased to fourteen thousand dollars a month, and that is when they finally decided to move on. I think this actually tells the hopeless story of the journey of this country towards obnoxiously high rents and by this country I mean the US. You know I can actually imagine the scenario like we also don't live in a cheap place this is also a pretty high rent area if all of a sudden my rent triples I don't think I can afford to live here anymore. And you know I just remembered this documentary on Donald Trump's son-in-law this documentary is also on Netflix. So his son-in-law has a real estate company that does the same thing of moving real estate away from rent control but in a much brutal way and they do this because of course it's beneficial to their firm what they do is they target tier 2 cities where apartments are on rent control and people are living in this apartment built by his company for years and years and when those people refuse to move out they basically threaten them strangers crash in and destroy their apartments they start unneeded constructions that go on for 24 hours so tenants can't sleep for days and months it's so brutal that sounds horrible it's actually cruel and it's just sad that these rich people and these rich corporations get to do that it's sort of sad that they always can also find like legal loopholes to just get away with things like these yeah and in the end it's just that the tenant has to either pay up or they have to move out and i guess even nora had to move out it is not easy for anyone if, even if you're rich it's stressful to move like you kind of do start over like you have to find new go to places your dry cleaners or your favorite new places to eat yeah she also says that sometimes you love some food in one place so much but then you know the restaurant closes down or they stop making it completely or you have to move away from that place for her that dish was cabbage strudel she used to love this dish from one of the restaurants but then she had to move away to a different place so i wanted to ask you do you have something like that for yourself like a dish or a snack or a dessert that you loved and you long for not exactly like that like that place is still open but it's not in the area it's in seattle actually it's eris pie and i love their margarita pizza it's my favorite pizza ever i think i once made a special trip just around the pizza like just in a weekend i ate at that place three times so that gives you an idea how much i like that place wow. <laughs> and their pizza yeah that's one thing i long for definitely oh that's awesome <laughs> Now let's talk about some things that we didn't relate to in this book. So one of the essays that was on cookbooks, she said that she has this obsession with cookbooks and while cooking her food, she would imagine someone famous cooking with her and talking to her. I didn't relate to this at all. Me either. First of all, I don't like cooking. 
it's a chore for me at the best. So I don't think I would ever cook and imagine celebrities cooking with me. That's not a scenario in my life. Yeah, me too. And also cookbooks are such a thing of the past. Well, Kelly, we do have cocktail books. Both of us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I think maybe it's more a matter of interest for us. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I think a chapter that I didn't find particularly relatable was where she's talking about losing vision as she is growing old. But I think that's something more our parents would relate to with them needing classes now to read books, newspapers and all that. But you know, we are also like not too far behind on this stage in our lives. <laughs> yeah, I did think of that and it made me sad. So I decided to just move on. Remember happy <laughs> thoughts only. Another essay, which I don't think either of us could relate to much, was on parenting in three stages. But I think she did have a lot of valuable advice in that. It was also kind of sad to see how anxious parents must feel when their children go away. Like, that's what she was talking about in the essay. That's true. Also, I think it was very, very brave of her to talk about Bill Clinton and to accept in front of the world that she loved a guy who ditched her. I don't think I could ever reveal my secrets to random strangers in a book like that. <laughs> well, I guess if you were writing a book at her age, you might not care so much. Yeah, that's true again. Yeah, old people are like, fuck everything. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing is from a chapter that we already discussed, which is about her whole apartment story, where she needed to move from Upper West Side to Upper East Side. When I was reading that, I was like, I feel so alienated from this world. Firstly, moving from west side to east side, which is kind of an upgrade. I couldn't get how that's a bad thing. And secondly, <laughs> it was that you have to move from a rented place to buying a place. All of it was very unrelatable to me. Yeah, I don't think I'm at that point where I'm ready to go house hunting. Yeah, me either. I just find the whole idea very stressful. And I don't think I'm ready to spend my weekends that way. And your money as well. True. There's also an essay that's full of advice. They're mostly one-liners. It's called What I Wish I Had Known. I think that's one chapter that falls in both categories, right? Like It's relatable and not relatable, depending on who is reading the chapter. And I think everyone can find something in that for themselves. Today's podcast is presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to monetize your podcast. Providing podcasters with a flat rate for ad space, so you always know how much you get when you include an ad from Podgo. I recently joined as a member and you can too. Apply today to become a member and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's podgo.co at p-o-d-g-o dot c-o. Now, let's give a shout out to our dear listener, Mew Mew the Cat, who loves our podcast and left us a review on Apple Podcasts. She says, such a good podcast, love their perspectives and insights. Highly recommend to all the brown girls out there. Thanks, Mew Mew. We love you. We love you. And now it's time for brownie points. I would give this book one brownie point for Nora's funny writing. Even in parts where I couldn't really relate to what she was saying or what was going on, her writing was so witty and funny that it made it for an easy and light read. Yeah, I did feel the same, actually. Like, her writing was awesome. Also, another brownie point I would like to give to the book, because in a humorous way, she brings up a lot of little issues that women face in their day-to-day -day lives. That was good to read. Yeah, I agree. Now, I think I have to take one brownie point away because there was so much in the book that I just could not relate to. It was like a high-class, rich people world that when I was reading about so many of her problems, I was like, is that really a problem? <laughs> yeah, I agree. I felt the same. But at least, you know, we got a sneak peek into America's first world. There's your positive thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so this was our discussion on the book, I Feel Bad About My Night by Nora Ephron. We definitely encourage you guys to pick it up for her funny and witty writing. It's an easy and interesting read and gives you a lot to think about too. Thank you for listening to this episode of Brown Girls Read Podcast. If you like what you hear, please leave us a five-star rating and a comment. You can support us at anchor.fm slash browngirlsread slash support. Your support will allow us to continue this podcast and bring more episodes to you. 
Also, don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Instagram, Brown Girls Read Pod. And if you have book recommendations for us, you can leave us a comment or message on Instagram. For our next episode, we are reading all the words unspoken by Serena Kaur. We hope you'll be reading with us. And until then, keep listening. Keep listening.